James Cagney was a legend and a powerful enigma of the silver screen. Did you know that he shattered the conventional stereotypes throughout his illustrious career? Known for his unforgettable portrayals of murderous thugs, Cagney possessed a hidden talent that set him apart from his contemporaries. But truth be told, if life were a battlefield, Cagney would be a war hero. This is the story of James Francis Cagney, the stardom. With his fiery presence and captivating talent, James Francis Cagney so made his marks on the silver screen, becoming a legend in his own right that even his predecessors stood akimbo in awe of his gigantic strides. In the early 1930s, Cagney burst onto the cinematic scene, portraying complex characters in unforgettable films like The Public Enemy, Taxi, and Angels with Dirty Faces. His magnetic presence and versatility captivated audiences, but little did he know that his success would come at a price. Typecast and limited by his tough guy reputation, Cagney found himself yearning for more. Born in 1899 on the vibrant streets of New York City, Cagney's origins were as colorful as the characters he portrayed. The exact location of his birth remains a subject of debate to date. Some claim it was on the bustling corner of Avenue D and 8th Street, while others assert it was in a top-floor apartment at 391 East 8th Street. Regardless of the precise address, one thing was certain, he was destined for greatness. Cagney's father, James Francis Cagney Sr., hailed from proud Irish stock. He was a bartender and amateur boxer. He personified the fighting spirit that would later define his son's on-screen persona. Curiously, his birth certificate listed him as a telegraphist, a curious twist of fate, perhaps. His mother, Carolyn Elizabeth, had a heritage as diverse as the high seas. With a Norwegian ship's captain for a father and an Irish mother, she brought a touch of adventure to Cagney's ancestry. As the second of seven children, Cagney's early years were marked by both joy and sorrow. Two of his siblings tragically passed away shortly after birth, casting a dark shadow over his childhood. Cagney was fragile and sickly during his infancy. He staggered so badly not looking healthy that even his mother feared that he might slip away before being baptized. It was a very harrowing start to a life that would be shaped by the crucible of poverty, an experience that Cagney believed had contributed to his delicate health. The family's circumstances led them to undertake two moves while Cagney was still a young boy. First, they settled on East 79th Street before making their way to East 96th Street, chasing dreams and seeking a better life. It was at St. Francis de Sales Roman Catholic Church in Manhattan that Cagney received his confirmation, showing his deep-rooted faith that would resonate throughout his life. With fiery red hair and piercing blue eyes, Cagney possessed a striking appearance that matched his inner fire. He completed his education at New York City's prestigious Stuyvesant High School in 1918, setting the stage for a journey that would take him from the hallowed halls of academia to the dazzling lights of showbiz. Enrolling at Columbia College with dreams of pursuing art, he explored a world of creativity and self-expression. Yet, destiny had other plans in store for Cagney. The tragic grip of the 1918 flu pandemic snatched away his father's life, which forced him to abandon his studies and return to the embrace of his grieving family. From the architecture work field to the bustling offices of the New York Sun, Cagney embraced a multitude of jobs in his quest for survival and prosperity. He walked the halls of the New York Public Library as a humble book custodian, carried the burdens of guests as a bellhop, and lent his skill as a draftsman painting a tapestry of life experiences that would fuel his artistic journey. Through it all, he selflessly dedicated his earnings to his family, a testament to his unwavering love and loyalty. Fate, however, had a way of weaving its intricate threads, leading Cagney to Florence James. One fateful day while toiling away amidst the hallowed shelves of the New York Public Library, Cagney's path intersected with destiny. It was here that he encountered Florence James, a beacon of opportunity in the vast sea of his ambitions. She recognized the spark within him, the ember of talent yearning to burst into a blazing inferno of creativity. Cagney's transformation was imminent as Florence guided him towards the footlights, 
illuminating a path he never thought he would traverse. Initially content to work behind the scenes, he had never harbored aspirations of stepping into the limelight. One fateful night when the universe conspired to test the bounds of young Cagney's fortitude, his brother Harry fell ill, leaving a void that needed to be filled. Although not an understudy by any means, Cagney possessed an extraordinary gift, an eidetic memory that captured every nuance and step of the rehearsals. With unwavering determination, he donned his brother's mantle, taking the stage without a single misstep, igniting the audience with his unexpected brilliance. In that transformative moment, Cagney felt the surge of adrenaline coursing through his veins, the electric energy of the crowd echoing in his very soul. It was a revelation, a glimpse into a world he had never dared to dream of. And from that day forward, he embraced the spotlight, ready to hone his powerful skills on the silver screen. Little did he know that his journey had only just begun. From tap dancing prodigy to street fighter, Cagney wove together a thousand talents that defied convention. His nimble feet, honed on the cellar doors of his youth, would become his signature, earning him the affectionate moniker Cellar Door Cagney. And as he danced, he moved higher, enchanting audiences with his unparalleled grace and raw intensity. But Cagney's ambitions knew no bounds. Beyond the realm of entertainment, he harbored dreams of conquering the baseball diamond, envisioning himself as a revered player in the major leagues. His passion for the sport burned bright, and he even played semi-professionally for a local team. The allure of the game beckoned him, whispering promises of glory and triumph. The beautiful sunrise. There is no smoke without a fire, and the fragrance of James Cagney's life that we enjoy today are built up sparks from opportunities that met coincidences. How? In the year 1911, James Cagney was working at Wanamaker's department store when a colleague noticed his dancing skills. This Good Samaritan colleague told him about an opportunity to be in a play called Every Sailor, where the chorus was made up of servicemen dressed as women. With strong fire in his bones, Cagney auditioned for the chorus, even though he only knew one dance step called the Peabody. Surprisingly, the producers were convinced that he could dance and hired him. While waiting to perform, he learned the other dancers' moves and added them to his repertoire. Cagney's mother wanted him to focus on getting an education, so she wanted him to quit the play after two months. But Cagney enjoyed his $35 every week, which was a lot of money for him at the time. To please his mother, he also got a job as a brokerage house runner. However, he continued to audition for more stage work and eventually joined the musical Pitter Patter, topping an additional $20 a week. Cagney worked hard and even took on multiple jobs at once, like being a dresser for one of the leads and understudying for the lead actor. Pitter Patter wasn't a huge success, but it ran for a whole 32 weeks, allowing Cagney to join the vaudeville circuit. He and Vernon performed separately in different troupes, but reunited to do comedy routines and musical numbers together. This guy was really out to make money, and after years of struggling to achieve this, Cagney and Vernon moved to Hawthorne, California in 1924, hoping to break into the movie industry. But they didn't find success right away, and Cagney's dance studio didn't attract many clients. Still inspired by his heroic voice, they eventually decided to return to New York, where they attempted to make money on stage, but it still collapsed. In 1925, Cagney secured his first significant acting role in a play called Outside Looking In. He played a tough guy and received good reviews for his performance. After the play ended, Cagney returned to vaudeville for a few years, at least now he has gotten into various levels of success. Hope shone brighter this time again when he crossed paths with George Cohen, whom he would later portray in the film Yankee Doodle Dandy. In the movie, luckily for Cagney, he got the lead role in the West End production of Broadway in the 1926 to 1927 season. However, the show's management wanted him to copy the performance of another actor, which made him uncomfortable. Just before sailing for England, they replaced him with another actor. This was a devastating blow for Cagney, and he almost gave up on show business. But he soon found work as an understudy for the Broadway show and established a dance school. Eventually, he landed roles in other plays and gained experience working with other talented and powerful directors. 
Days with Warner Brothers. Joan Blondell and James Cagney acted together in a play called Maggie the Magnificent. They later reunited in another play called Penny Arcade. Although Penny Arcade received negative reviews, Cagney and Blondell were praised by the critics. Al Jolson saw potential in the play for a film adaptation and bought the rights for $20,000. He then sold the rights to Warner Brothers, but with the condition that Cagney and Blondell had to star in the movie. The film, now called Sinner's Holiday, was released in 1930, but with different actors in the lead roles. Cagney played a tough character named Harry Delano in Sinner's Holiday. Despite being a bad guy, the role generated sympathy because of his difficult upbringing. This type of sympathetic bad character became a common role for Cagney throughout his career. While filming Sinner's Holiday, Cagney disagreed with the director about a line in the script. He refused to say the line, and the director threatened to report him to the studio. However, they ended up removing the line from the film. The studio liked Cagney's performance, and before his initial three-week contract was over, they extended it for another three weeks. This was followed by a full seven-year contract at a salary of $400 per week. However, the contract allowed the studio to drop him after any 40-week period which meant he only had guaranteed income for 40 weeks at a time. Like he did when he was younger, Cagney shared his earnings with his family. Cagney received positive reviews for his work in Sinner's Holiday and continued to play similar gangster roles in movies like The Doorway to Hell, which came out in the year 1930. The film was successful and contributed to Cagney's growing reputation. He made a few more movies after that, but he wasn't satisfied with his contract. Cagney wanted more money for his successful films, but he was also open to taking a lower salary if his popularity declined. However, Warner Brothers refused his requests, and Cagney walked out again. He held out for a salary of $400 per week, the same as other popular actors at the time. Warner Brothers suspended him, but eventually, a deal was reached. Cagney's salary was increased to around $3,000 per week, and he was given top billing and a maximum of four films per year. Cagney wanted to help others and spread his wealth. He regularly sent money and goods to his friends from his old neighborhood, although he kept this generosity private. Cagney also witnessed the intense work schedules of actors, even teenagers, who were often forced to work long hours on multiple films. This experience motivated him to advocate for better working conditions, and he played a significant role in forming the Screen Actors Guild in 1933. Cagney's portrayal of Cody Jarrett in the 1949 film White Heat is considered one of his most memorable performances. In the 10 years since his last collaboration with director Walsh, things had changed in the cinema industry, and Cagney's portrayal of gangsters had evolved as well. Unlike his character Tom Powers in The Public Enemy, Jarrett was depicted as a wild and unstable person with few redeeming qualities. Cagney's appearance had also changed over the years, with gray hair and a paunch, which reflected in his performance. He wanted to play Jarrett as a psychotic character, and the fits of rage and headaches were his idea. Cagney's final lines in the film, Made it, Ma, Top of the World, have become iconic and were ranked as the 18th greatest movie line by the American Film Institute. His explosive outburst upon hearing of his mother's death in prison is also widely praised as one of his most memorable moments. Some extras on set were actually frightened by his intense portrayal. Cagney attributed his performance to his father's alcoholic rages and his observations during a visit to a mental hospital. White Heat received critical acclaim although some critics questioned the social impact of a character they saw as sympathetic. Cagney was still trying to break free from his gangster image. He expressed his desire to make a film that children could watch, but Warner Brothers, perhaps looking for another Yankee Doodle Dandy, assigned him a musical for his next project, The West Point Story 1950, co-starring Doris Day, whom he admired. His subsequent film, Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, was another gangster movie and the first produced by Cagney's own production company. Although it was unfavorably compared to White Heat by critics, it performed reasonably well at the box office, allowing Cagney Productions to pay off some of its debts. However, 
Cagney Productions was not ultimately successful, and in 1953, after William Cagney produced his final film, A Lion is in the Streets, loosely based on politician Huey Long, the company ceased to exist. Freedom Attempt In March 1942, Cagney announced that he and his brother William were starting Cagney Productions to release films through United Artists. With this new venture, Cagney was free from Warner Brothers. He took some time to relax on his farm in Martha's Vineyard before volunteering to join the USO, United Service Organizations. He embarked on a tour across the United States, entertaining troops with vaudeville routines and scenes from his famous film Yankee Doodle Dandy. In September 1942, he was elected as the president of the Screen Actors Guild. About a year after its establishment, Cagney Productions released its first film, Johnny Come Lately, in 1943. While other major studios were making patriotic war movies, Cagney wanted to challenge his tough guy image. He aimed to show a different side of himself in this film, which he considered a personal expression of his alter ego. The movie received mixed reviews, ranging from excellent to poor. After completing the film, Cagney returned to the USO and toured military bases in the UK. He focused on rehearsals and performances, declining interviews with the British press. He gave multiple daily performances for the Army Signal Corps, showcasing the history of American dance, including dances from Yankee Doodle Dandy. Cagney's production company then produced their second film, Blood on the Sun. Cagney insisted on performing his own stunts and received judo training for the role. However, the film did not perform as well as their first production. Around this time, Cagney learned about war hero Audie Murphy and thought he had the potential to be a movie star. Although Cagney believed Murphy lacked acting skills, he helped him come to Hollywood, and Murphy's contract was eventually sold to another studio. While negotiating the rights for their third independent film, Cagney took on a role in 20th Century Fox's 13 Rue Madeleine. The wartime spy film was successful, and Cagney was eager to start production on his next project, an adaptation of William Saroyan's Broadway play, The Time of Your Life. However, the film turned out to be a commercial failure, and audiences struggled to accept Cagney in a non-tough guy role. Cagney Productions faced serious financial difficulties due to poor returns on their films and a legal dispute with Sam Goldwyn's studio over a rental agreement. As a result, Cagney returned to Warner Brothers and signed a distribution production deal with them for the film White Heat. This effectively made Cagney Productions a part of Warner Brothers' days in Sunset. In 1955, Cagney stepped in to replace Spencer Tracy in the Western film Tribute to a Bad Man for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. His performance received praise, and the studio was impressed enough to offer him these wilder years alongside Barbara Stanwyck. The two stars had a great rapport, having both come from vaudeville backgrounds, and they entertained the cast and crew off-screen with their singing and dancing. In a rare television role, Cagney starred in Robert Montgomery's Soldiers from the War returning in 1956. He did this as a favor to Montgomery, who needed a strong season opener to save his series from being canceled. Cagney's appearance ensured the show's success. However, he made it clear to reporters that television wasn't his medium, stating his admiration for those who worked in the fast-paced TV industry, but feeling that it wasn't for him. The following year, Cagney starred in Man of a Thousand Faces, where he portrayed a fictionalized version of actor Lon Chaney. The film received excellent reviews, with one publication rating it as one of Cagney's best performances. It was a box office hit, and Cagney's ability to mimic and his physical resemblance to Chaney helped him connect with the audience on an emotional level. In 1957, Cagney took on his first and only directing role in Shortcut to Hell, a remake of the 1941 film This Gun for Hire. Despite being encouraged by friends to try directing, Cagney found it boring and had no desire to continue in that role. The film was made on a low budget and shot quickly. Cagney emphasized that he was an actor, not a director, and refused any payment for his directing work. Cagney's final musical came in 1959 with Never Steal Anything Small, where he portrayed a labor leader. 
The film featured a comical song and dance duet with Kara Williams, who played his girlfriend. For his next film, Shake Hands with the Devil, Cagney traveled to Ireland to work with director Michael Anderson. Although he had hoped to explore his Irish ancestry, time constraints and poor weather prevented him from doing so. The film's message about the cycle of violence resonated with Cagney, and his portrayal of an Irish Republican Army commander was considered by some critics to be one of his finest performances in his later years. Personal Life Do you remember Cagney's first music project in 1920 with Pitter Patter? Something truly magical happened in James Cagney's life at the time. He found his heart's desire in the chorus of a show called Pitter Patter when he met the lovely Francis Willard Billy Vernon. Their connection was so deep and genuine that on September 28, 1922, they vowed to love each other forever in marriage. Their love blossomed even more beautifully in 1940 when they decided to expand their family. They opened their hearts and adopted a son, whom they lovingly named James Francis Cagney III. Later on, their joy multiplied as they welcomed a precious daughter, Kathleen Casey Cagney. Cagney cherished his family with all his being, but he was known for his private nature. While he occasionally allowed the press a glimpse into their lives through photographs, he valued their personal moments away from the prying eyes of the public. Their family faced heartache when tragedy struck their son, who suffered a heart attack and passed away in Washington, D.C., two years before his father's own departure. It was an unimaginable loss that sparked curiosity among fans when he finally lost his beloved daughter Kathleen on August 11, 2004. Away from the glamour of Hollywood, Cagney nourished another passion that ignited his soul. Farming. It all started when he attended a soil conservation lecture as a young man, sparking a deep love for agriculture within him. His dedication to farming was so strong that during his first walkout from Warner Brothers, he played a vital role in establishing a charming 100-acre farm in Martha's Vineyard. The rustic property, with its dirt tracks instead of paved roads, captured Cagney's heart. To protect their peaceful haven from eager movie fans, he even spread a playful rumor of having hired a gunman for security. The tactic worked so well that when Spencer Tracy came to visit, his taxi driver refused to drive him up to the house, fearing the danger. Tracy had no choice but to walk the rest of the way, adding a touch of adventure to their reunion. In 1955, after starring in three films, Cagney made a remarkable decision. He purchased a 120-acre farm in Stanfordville, New York for $100,000. He lovingly named it Vernie Farm, cleverly combining the first syllable of Billy's maiden name with his own surname. With unwavering passion and dedication, he transformed it into a flourishing working farm, where life flourished in harmony. Cagney's love for agriculture ran so deep that it earned him an honorary degree from Rollins College in Florida, recognizing his remarkable contributions. Instead of simply accepting the degree with a glamorous partner by his side, he surprised the college by submitting a paper on soil conservation, showcasing his unwavering commitment to the cause. Despite the passing of time and the rise of automobiles, Cagney's childhood love for horses never faded. Even as an adult, he kept the spirit of his youthful equestrian adventures alive by raising horses on his farms. The majestic Morgan breed held a special place in his heart, and he nurtured their grace and beauty with tender care. James Cagney was a man of many passions, both on and off the silver screen, and his love for his family, farming, horses, sailing and painting knew no bounds. He embraced life with a truly remarkable fervor. His legacy lives on, not only through his unforgettable performances, but also in the stories of his vibrant and multifaceted life, The Bow. The world stood still on that fateful Easter Sunday in 1986 when the news of James Cagney's passing reached the hearts of millions. It was a day filled with sorrow, as the remarkable talent and vibrant spirit of this beloved actor were extinguished forever. Cagney, at the age of 86, succumbed to a heart attack that took him away from his cherished Dutchess County farm in Stanford, New York. The weight of grief hung heavy in the air as family, friends, and admirers gathered to bid their final farewells. The St. Francis de Sales Roman Catholic Church in Manhattan,
became a sanctuary of solace, where a funeral mass was held in honor of the extraordinary life that had touched so many. The eulogy, delivered by his dear friend Ronald Reagan, resonated with love and admiration, capturing the essence of Cagney's spirit and the indelible mark he left on the world. In a tender and poignant moment, James Cagney found his final resting place in the tranquil surroundings of the Garden Mausoleum at the Cemetery of the Gate of Heaven in Hawthorne, New York. The crypt embraced his earthly remains, becoming a sacred space where his memory would forever reside. The passing of James Cagney marked the end of an era, a loss felt not only by those who knew him personally, but by the countless individuals who had been touched by his talent and presence. His departure left an indescribable void, a void filled with memories of his electrifying performances, his unwavering dedication to his craft, and his larger-than-life spirit. Although he may have left this world, his legacy lives on, forever engraved in the hearts of those who were fortunate enough to witness his greatness. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.